The most important thing for you all to know is, is that these discussions are live and interactive. So feel free to use chat, Q&A, or raise your virtual hand and uh, you can interact with our panel members um, and, and other folks in the audience too. Um, now, the we're able to provide these discussions to you free of charge and the Positive Aging Sourcebook free of charge through the wonderful support of our Positive Aging Community Champions. These generally fall into three buckets of housing options, aging in place options, and resources. And we got a real treat today because um, I've got one of our Positive Aging Community Champions here who uh, can tell you a little bit about her profession, but more importantly, a real special event that um, we've got coming up here. And uh, so everybody meet Ellen Platt with the Option Group. And Ellen is an aging life care manager, which is an essential profession to, um, uh, to helping, uh, helping us navigate these confusing waters that we call elder care. Um, Ellen, I'm excited to share with everybody what you're up to, but before we do that, maybe just g give everybody a, a, a little glimpse of what does an aging life care manager do? Sure. Well, thanks, Steve. It's, it's great to see everybody today. Um, at the Option Group, we have a, a group of, of care managers, aging life care managers, um, come from a different uh, set of backgrounds, social work, nursing, gerontology, rehabilitation counseling. But what we do is we help families navigate their medical care. We advocate for them on their behalf as we coordinate services, or we may help place them in appropriate levels of care. Um, we're not paid by any facility or service that we refer to. We are really their advocate. And so we help find what is in their best interest and what is the best next step for them. Our role is to improve their quality of life to keep them as independent and comfortable and safe as possible and functioning as well as they can. Um, so we work with seniors and solo agers, um, but we also work with people who maybe have a, a disability or a medical condition or have had some type, type of catastrophic injury and they really need somebody to be that advocate for them. Great. And Noel, has, as I see, he has dropped in contact information to get in touch with you um, so and your team. So, but now let's talk about the fun stuff. So I'm going to bring this up on the screen. So if all of you haven't heard, um, Ellen is going to be one of the featured dancers at the um, annual Alzheimer's Association Memory Ball in Baltimore, which is on May 6th. I heard it's totally sold out. Um, and um, the uh, uh, and 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 I'm going to share this website with everybody because if you scroll down, you can see they've already raised over half a million dollars. Here you've got you've got all the dancers, but if you click on Ellen's link, you can support Ellen in her cause. Or if you know any of the other dancers, it's certainly if you support more than one, nobody's going to complain about that. Um, but uh, Ellen, tell us a little bit about your experience and and what's uh, what's going on with this uh, this gala. It's one of their biggest fundraisers of the year for the Alzheimer's Association, and it really all of the money goes towards research and programming for families of um, folks with dementia. So I, in the work that I do, I'm working with families who are struggling and going down that long journey of dementia. And this is the way I felt that I could give back. Um, so it's done in a dancing with the stars kind of format. They've paired each of us, um, you know, people who work in the field, they've paired us up with professionals and we have a, a dance that we have to do and people are gonna be there about 900 people. Wow. And they're going to be uh, voting for dollars with dollars um, to raise money for Alzheimer's. Great. And what what I know I'm botching this, but what genre are you dancing in? So it's a 1980s theme. Um, I hear there's going to be a lot of cha-cha. Our dance is going to be Paso Doba, and, uh, which is uh, like a Spanish dance with some other things, flamenco and some other things in there. So I'm learning a lot. I'm stretching so far out of my comfort zone but it's all for a good cause. All right. Well, th 
Thanks so much, Ellen. Uh, best of luck. Uh, or it, it shouldn't even say best of luck. Have a great time. And the fact that you've you've stretched and learned something is absolutely amazing. Um, so, uh, all right. So, let's see. Um, I got a couple more housekeeping items here, and then we will be getting Lisa on. But let me go back to sharing my screen. Um, and where are we at here? Okay, so um, I had mentioned uh, that uh, the Positive Aging Community Champions support what we do. You can find Ellen and hundreds of other uh, organizations that serve, that can help you on our website at proaging.com, right at the top. You can order free copies of Sourcebook, as many as you need, and then Important to today's discussion, this is going to be recorded. It'll also be on a podcast. And if you go to the website on the left-hand side, you'll see it there later this afternoon. In addition, we'll have all the chat transcripts, so you don't need to necessarily be taking notes. And then on the right-hand side, you can see what we've got coming up. Uh, coming up. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to do this year is put more real life stories on the, the podium. And uh, tomorrow we're gonna hear a real life story of a caregiver who's gonna share her journey of taking care of her mom with uh, dementia. So feel free to tune in on that, but all of our things are recorded. We've got a bunch of other things coming up this, um, this, uh, this month that might be of interest to you. Um, Two discussions that I want to spotlight that are coming up that are relevant to today's discussion in terms of what we do with our stuff are we have two discussions, one in April and one in May, all dealing with how do we organize and catalog photos and what do we do with our photos. So um, definitely tune in uh, to those, mark your calendar, and uh, we hope to, uh, to join you. Yeah, we hope that you join us. Okay, so let me hit the record button here. And I have really been looking forward to this discussion for quite some time. I've known Lisa Gerisi Rigoni for uh, for several years, and I saw that she was writing a book, and we love having authors on these discussions because they've really deeply researched their given topic and they can speak so objectively and um, thoughtfully. And uh, so we're going to learn about Lisa's book, but the title of this discussion, which I've received so many emails that everybody loves it is, the stuff about your stuff isn't about your stuff. And so I'm super psyched to dive into this very important topic. And, and you know, Lisa, when we talk about um, stretching ourselves, when Ellen talks about learning a new dance and, you know, the challenges of that, I, I think that anybody that's gone through any moving, downsizing, decluttering really probably walks away from that as terms of, holy cow, this, I was really stretching myself. Yeah, exactly. Ellen's stretching herself in probably a couple of ways for that. So yeah, very impressed with that, Ellen. Good luck. So um, but yeah, but, yeah. But Downsizing, this, moving, organizing is one of those things we most people don't look forward to. No, no, but but we're gonna hopefully change a few minds in the audience today. But Lisa, before we dive into your book and giving us some tips and suggestions on how we can um deal with our stuff, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your background and and what you, got you into all this. Well, thank, first, thanks for having me on. I'm thrilled. I've been watching your videos for years and it feels like a, years and years and years. So I know it's only been it. three. <laughs> <laughs> well, COVID seems like it, you know, it got on every, you know, every time there was something to get on. Um, but it's been really great. And, and actually hearing your story a couple of weeks ago was really amazing too. Yeah. Um, so let's do the long story short. Uh, had a, First, first of all, my first career in my teens and 20s, I was a professional dancer, singer, actress. And then I, I know everyone's like, what? We need to get you on with Ellen. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Oh, that would be fun. That would definitely be stretching me. And then I did, uh, I had a personal training and fitness company in Chicago, which I worked with a lot of seniors. So 
have always learned from seeing, you know, people older than now I'm the age of my clients. You know, I just turned 57. So I'm kind of the clients I had during my personal training. And um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. And I'm still learning and learning from everyone. So we moved here with a six month old from Chicago. I thought, oh, I'll just get back to personal training and fitness. Luckily, you know, my husband had enough of a, a business, that, a, a job that I didn't have to go to work right away. So I could be a mom, which was wonderful. So started meeting moms, doing play dates. They would say, oh, my kitchen's such a mess. My garage is such a mess. I, I, I'm so cluttered. I can't or, or get organized. I'm like, let's do something about it. And we would just start doing it. And friends would then tell their friends, I'm like, oh, great. You know, we'll have a glass of wine afterwards. You know, that was kind of like kids will play and we'll organize. And found out that it was, I was really good at it and I loved it. And most people didn't as much as I did. <laughs> yeah. And I was surprised at that. So a girlfriend of mine, and this is in the book, how I kind of how I started said, you know, we're redoing my basement. You know, can you help me do that? Yeah, sure. So I had been working at the YMCA for $30 an hour, whatever I was teaching classes. And so I said, okay, pay me 30 bucks an hour. I don't know, you know, cause you wanted to pay me something. I did such a great job. It was so easy, so fun. And she said, you should do this as a business. And my first thought was, well, this isn't a business. This is just something I like that people don't like that I found out. And then I did some research and realized, oh yeah, this is a pretty big business because people don't have the time to do it. And so I started it. So I came from a business background, entrepreneur, and I knew, okay, I need a name. I need insurance. I'm going into people's homes. Yes, I'm working with like my fellow friends and moms, but I was touching their stuff. What if it was broken? Things like that. So in 2008, I started Leave It to Lisa. And in 2015, and I had brought, I brought people on because we got fairly busy quickly and then started networking and marketing and, you know, just really getting, getting good at my craft, like making it something that I was really good at, not just you know, it's something that just came to me easily. I really want to know the ins and outs. Um, I work with a lot of therapists now who refer us because there is, there's a, there's different, uh, let's say there's different ways of working with different people. So I am not a therapist. I play one on TV. I joke, but um, I do find, I know what to say to people because I really listen to them and each job is unique. So how can I help you right here today? Oh, and wow. 2015 rebranded to the organizing mentors because of that reason, because we were doing more than just clearing stuff. We're the company. I have five organizers. I call them my team mentors and they go into a home. We don't care what it looks like. You know, we really take it personally how to help them and been doing this for a long time. So we're mentoring our clients and we are, we're not the kind of organizing company. And I love the ones that are out there that are making like things beautiful, you know, like our clients' houses look great afterwards. But if you look at my website, it's, this is how they're living. You know, it's not, it's not the home edit, which I adore, you know, it's perfect. Everything's lined up, labeled, you know, beautiful. We, make their brains beautiful. <laughs> we calm their space, which is a lot different than making everything look perfect. I love it. This is great. Okay. So now, um, yeah, and, and it's interesting, you've had two professions in uh, personal training and then in organizing, which are two things that people know that they need to do, but it's really hard to do it on their it own. Is. And um, so that that's pretty cool. But um, so now, Let's, uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled that you, you wrote a book. I know that's no easy task. Yeah. And, um, the, uh, tell us what led to the, um, to, uh, putting this book together and I will drop in the link where everybody can learn more about the book. I've got okay. it on the screen and, uh, um, uh, but tell us, tell us what led to this. So during COVID, needed something to do. And I told you before I started my company as Leave It to Lisa. And I found out also when I was 40, and you read this in the book, that I found out I had ADD. 
And my way of coping, one of my ways of coping when I was younger was to organize, didn't realize that. But so my, for me to learn things and to really uh, remember, I like acronyms. So leave it to Lisa is L-I-T-L, little. So when I saw that, I thought, hmm, that's, we help our clients a little. We organize a little. They get rid of a little stuff. So again, when I started teaching and people were asked, well, what do you do how, and how to train my staff and people that work for me? I created the little system. And the little system is L, let it go. So what are the things you know you don't want? I is transform. I, 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 is, I is not transform. <laughs> I is intentional. And that kind of, oh, what do we want? Do we want grandma's china? I don't know what I should do with this. Is it going to fit me? I paid a lot of money for it. So it's more discussion. T is transform, making those decisions. You've transformed your space and your life. And L is love it and live it. So I thought, since I do that talk a lot and I teach that a lot, I'll write the little system. So I have things to hand out to people after my, at my workshops or realtors or clients. So I started doing that. My marketing team referred me to someone who was starting a book group because I, Steve, I had no idea how to write a book. I just thought, oh, I'm going to do this little brochure. I'm going to hand it out. Can't be that difficult, right? And stretching myself, right? And talked about what I did for my clients, like I kind of described to you. And the group said, you have to write that book first. And so the the book that I wrote, 17 Spatulas and the Man Who Fried an Egg, is not a how-to book on organizing. It's It has my little system in there and it describes what we do. But I feel, at, well, every house I go to has an organizing book on their shelf. And it just becomes more stagnant energy and something, oh, I didn't do that, or I couldn't do that system. And I don't want that for people. I want people to find what works for them. Marie Kondo or whatever, you know, the home edit, whatever works for you, let's do that in your home. Mm -hmm. So I started writing, actually, okay, I, I admit this, we didn't write this down in the, in the book, but so I can't type and I'm, I have ADD. So my brain goes a lot faster than my fingers when I do type. And so I, I thought voice to text, how do I do that? But I didn't want to put it on my phone. So I got a dragon. It's an app on your computer. Yep, that's great. So I literally got my headset on one day. Actually, it was my dad. It would have been my dad's 88th birthday, February 17th, 2000, or yeah, 2021. And I just started talking stories. And I talked, I talk a lot, you know me. I talked uh, 55,000, over 55,000 words in a month, <laughs> story upon story upon story upon story. And I realized how universal the themes were that my clients were dealing with that I, I've dealt with in my life. And so I used the little system. I let go of things like 55,000 words that didn't fit what worked, put together the book. And it's basically in four parts of the little system. So ideas and stories about letting go, how difficult that is intentional and then we move through and then the man who fried an egg is kind of the story that weaves everything together great okay mm -hmm. let me let me pull up the uh the book here because okay what i found is um giving folks a glimpse of the table of contents can help them see what's in the book but it's also great for talking points and yeah and yeah at any point in time if you've got questions about what to do with your stuff and this that and the other um just throw it into chat or Q and A and, and uh, Lisa and it can, can riff on this, but um, uh, I, I'm going to get back to the title of this book, but uh, 17 spatulas and the man who fried an egg. But, um, but as you can see, when we get to the table of contents, it's broken into four chapters, which are, you, you just told us. Uh, yeah, it's like the four sections. The beginning is really explaining four sections. Got me it. and what I do and, you know, how I came to this. Okay. And then yeah. it's let it go, intentional, uh, transform and love it or leave it. But, um, but before, let, it would be great to kind of dive into some real life examples that folks can do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, but 
can you give us the the quick overview of this uh, unusual title, uh, <laughs> 17 Spatulas and the Man Who Fried the Egg? So when I, when I exaggerate, I have always used the number 17. It's just, you know, as some people say, oh, 72 of this, four of this, or five of this. 17 just always comes off my lucky number seven. Maybe that's my favorite number seven. So I would say, and when I would introduce myself at business meetings or do my little elevator speech, I would say, well, we are, you know, we're organizers and we're certified move managers and we can help with the 17 spatulas to a whole house move, you know, pack up and move and unpack. And then I met a woman who had 17 spatulas and what she taught me was having something that means something to you. Keep what means something to you, what literally felt felt good in her hand and served a purpose. And what she didn't want were the new spatulas that family and friends had given her to replace those old ones that Hmm. they thought were burnt and old and out of date and whatever. So she taught me a huge lesson and that has rung true in my career now because I'm not going to judge. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't care what you keep. I care deeply, but it doesn't matter to me. It has to matter to you. So that just came about, you know, when I was thinking, well, what kind of title would I, what do we do? And then the man who fried an egg is a gentleman I worked with for eight months, at least three hours a week. He was a hoarder. He had gone through Uh, a lot of traumatic events in a short time and we could not walk through his. Well, we could walk through his three story townhouse, but he basically lived in the basement, couldn't get in his kitchen, hadn't used a stove dishwasher. He had a refrigerator and he ate frozen things and takeout. And what he, the therapy, and he was working with a therapist. So the three of us would get together every once in a while because I wanted that healing because I knew he needed it. And I needed it too, because I walked into his place, Steve, and it was the first time I said, "Um, I'm in over my head. How could I possibly help this man? And almost like said no. And then I realized, and and this is in the book too, I really, I had a, I would say a come to Jesus moment, but I had a moment when I said, I am here to help him. And that's why I'm here and turned and we just went through it. And he helped me a lot. He got me through a couple of things that happened in my life in those eight months. And I truly believe if he hadn't been healing himself, he wouldn't have been there for me and I couldn't have been there for him. And you have to read the whole book, but at the end of the book, you could probably tell what he finally was able to do, (laughs) which was a huge, which was just humongous. So when I thought about what we do for our clients, yeah, we can get rid of, you can help you with 17 spatulas, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it is. Or this man changed his whole life with with just organizing. Yeah, I, I, it seems like a lot to me because I think we have three spatulas and we can't shut the door because <laughs> the drawer. But um, all right, well, Paula has a little story that she's going to share. And I love kind of riffing off some of the real life stories yes. for community members. And she says, we're in day eight of our kitchen gut and remodel. I really need this. I spent six weeks packing the kitchen in the library. I threw away a lot of stuff and, and donated a lot, but I still have a lot to do. And she says, it's funny. One of our original spatulas, our household is almost 40 years old. So I took a picture of it and it looked a lot like the one that's on the book. Cover. Oh, yeah, it, it, that is the old school spatula. That actually came from my my marketing team's aunt. And because we were trying to figure out what to do with the cover, because I just couldn't figure out what I wanted to cover. And she's like, well, here's a picture of an old spatula. And I was like, that's it. That's it. Because that's that's what it is. And that, that she kept that. That's the one that kept. And you can see there's a little like melted piece on the handle, which is just it's just perfect. Well, let me, let me throw that up. Uh, <laughs> somebody actually said, can you show the cover of the book again? Yeah, I mean, look, it's there. been on the stove a couple too many times. The handles are melted. Yeah, handles no, melted. that's great. Well, so talking about um, uh, this little story, a couple of things that Paula brings up is, number one, 
it took six weeks. Okay. It took her six weeks, yeah. um, packing the kitchen and the library and, um, any sort of thoughts on like, obviously if somebody goes and hires somebody like you, they can get this done with some help, but yeah, you know, this is something that, that a lot of people want to do with th themselves or feel like they have to do it themselves. Yeah. What is an appropriate timeline and how can you sort of make this more manageable? So it seems six weeks is a long time, but again, you have a life. Maybe you have kids. You want to go out to dinner with your friends. You don't want to do it every single day, every hour. Yes. If you hire someone, you're going to set the time with us to do it, right? So you're going to do those three, four hours or eight hours, however, you know, you need. So I often, people always overestimate. They say, I think it's going to take, you know, about 20 hours and we're in there for like eight, you know, because when you're working with somebody, you have fun, you can talk, you can discuss things, you know, it goes a little quicker. Um, so Paula was her name. Mm -hmm. You said, Paula, I bet you packed a lot of stuff that you weren't sure about. And I'm just assuming because that I've done it too, believe me. Uh, I can't teach, you know, anything I haven't done for myself or in some way have experienced, right? <laughs> um, because if you, so I'm going to, I'm going to push the little system, the L, let it go. That is what you know you don't want. People get stuck. And this system is to be, ma to make any decision in your life. I've, I've tried it myself. Therapists have told me, yes, try it. Even doing this workshop, you know, even planning this. Well, what title are we going to use? Well, we're going to let go of that. We're going to let go of this. How much time do we need? You know, you use it to make any decision. Most people get caught. Say, okay, I have a pair of glasses here in my phone. So this I know I don't want. I don't know about this. Oh, I can't make the decision now. So I'm just going to pack it. If you had six weeks to do it, get rid of the stuff you know you don't want first because that's the initial don't want it you go in your closet take this out take this out no I don't want that books on your shelf old Tupperware well we don't have this size I don't know where the lid is oh just pack it so you probably have a lot more and I'm not judging you. I'm not saying you did it wrong because you did it yourself okay here is here is my suggestion when you unpack and if you're going to be in the same house it's better um, because most people just move and take everything and they spend so much money on moving because, oh, we'll do it when we get home or we get to the new house. It doesn't happen. I've been in houses. Oh, we, those boxes moved with us 15 years ago. <laughs> we have no idea what's in there. So if you're in the same house, I want you to do this, Paula. When you open a box, do you want that? And if you don't put it in a box for donation, if you don't know, just unpack it, just put it aside. Every box, I want you to do that, okay? And then then what's left, then you can make a decision on what's left, the intentional step. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the, there's other ways of doing things, of course. I think it's the best way because it's mine and I created it, but it's easy. It's not simple, it's easy. You mm -hmm. know in your heart, in your gut, what you don't want. You may not know what you want yet, but you know what you don't want. And, okay. and Paula, Paula also, she mentioned that she took a picture of the spatula and that's a wonderful way. It is. Oh, and, and then next month you can come to the discussions where we talk about organizing those photos. Right. That is clutter too. Okay. It is. <laughs> it is. Let's see. Oh. And I saw someone asked, I was looking at when you were reading that. Yep. Can I explain the stuff about your stuff is not about your stuff? Yeah, yeah, just explain that. Yeah. I came up with that because years ago and it has gotten everyone thinks it's like, what? What are you talking about? So, the stuff we make up about our stuff is not about our stuff. It's about our stuff. Yeah. So, we can't go to the gym um, the stuff about your stuff. Well, I'm I'm not in shape yet. I can't go to the gym till I'm in shape. Well, that's this. I can't organize because I don't have the time. That's this. So the stuff about your stuff, the excuses, I hate to use that word, but the excuses you make about not achieving a goal, not downsizing, not getting fit, not losing weight, not stopping smoking. It's not about 
that. It's about what you're telling yourself. Mm -hmm. And again, I do it to myself. You know, it's always, it's always learning. But what I've been able to do is acknowledge that first, like be aware, oh, I'm making this up. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. It's, it's kind of a cool saying. My, my daughter says that all the time now. She's like, Oh yeah, I don't want to study for that test because I want to go out. Well, that's the stuff about your stuff. You have to study for that. That has to get done. And then sometimes it can even be more literal where uh, I'm not using my mom's Hummel collection, but, and she's deceased, but I can't get rid of it because she wanted me to have it, you know? Um, And that, that, for that question, because I've had to ask myself the same thing, we Finally, my three brothers and I cleared out my parents' house. My other brother was living there, so it wasn't just abandoned. I brought a bunch of stuff home. And I and I just talked about this at the chamber breakfast with somebody. I said to myself, and I say this to my clients, would your mom, your grandmother want you, do you feel burdened or negative when you look at that Hummel collection? If you do, and it's not a good feeling, Do you think your parents or the person who gave you that would want you to feel that or would they want you to love it? Mm -hmm. So maybe keep one Hummel. Everyone thinks everything, you know, all those collectible things are worth a ton. That is going south, which I hate to say, because that's a lot of my clients' collections are things like that. And, but would you ask yourself that? Would your parent or your friend want you to feel negative or burdened by it? Yep. Um, okay, this is a great question from Rita. My deceased hus- husband left me with a coin accumulation with gold silver, which I do not know who to trust. Mm. Can you guide me through how I would find somebody that could help with the um, with something like that. Yeah, where are you located? Yeah, um, Rita, let us let us know where you're yeah, located because I have a wonderful person here um, that I can share with it, you. It, well, and here, meaning uh, in, in Northern Metro Virginia, yeah. DC, Northern Virginia. Yeah. So um, Rita, if you uh, drop a drop, drop where you're located, and yeah, perfect. Even, even if it's outside the region, we'll do. Yeah, our- we we can maybe find you. Yeah. yeah, and that is that is a very difficult thing to do is to trust somebody. Do a little research, but then again, people always say, "Well, this is worth." I saw this on you know, yeah, eBay yeah. for this. When you're doing that, look at what things sold for. Not oh, okay. She I could in uh, Crystal City. Crystal City. Okay, so you have my information. E- email me, and I will get you that information. Okay, let me throw uh, Lisa at theorganizingmentors.com. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm throwing Lisa's email into the chat, and if anybody else has, um, uh things that you want guidance on, we will make sure, you know, just reach out to her. Now, mm-hmm. Tiffany says, my friend and I just talked about this yesterday, the tension between hanging on to what we think is valuable, either due to the history or the monetary value, or because it can be used for something, for someone, yeah. um, and the freedom that comes from letting it go. Yes. Any words of wisdom on how to balance that, uh, that, I, I think there's a lot of guilt that goes on with this. Huge. Because you don't want it. So again, go to how it makes you feel. If it's going to make you feel better just donating it, there's a lot of places that that take things for free. You know, New Hope Homes and um, Habitat for Humanity is one of the, the best places. Yes, they sell things, but the money goes into making money and making homes for people, um, find a charity that you connect with, uh, that will take things. I saw it down here that, uh, there, you know, nobody wants it. Doesn't it. If you donate it somewhere, especially a habitat, they usually take everything, uh, and they, someone will buy it. And, but it's, again, it goes to how does it make you feel? Do you feel burdened? Do you feel guilty about not wanting it? And how would your parents feel? There's, and I've done this myself. I had a stamp collection of my parents, of my dad and my grandfathers. Not many people stamp collect anymore. That's a, something that's dying off, which is a shame. But I held on to this 
huge moving box. Steve moved it in my van from Chicago here because I had stamped people. I thought, oh, definitely. I'll find, I'll get some money. My brothers and I'll split it, you know, even if it's $500, whatever. I was holding on to that. And I realized, because I did the intentional decision or decisional step, I was holding on to it because my dad and my grandfather, my mom's dad, had this beautiful connection. My dad lived in Chicago, my dad, my grandfather in Washington State, and they would text each other, text, no, it wasn't that, they would email, they would mail things to each other. And my grandfather would come visit and he would have stamps and they'd sit at the dining room table for hours. And I loved that. And I wanted to be part of that world. And I was holding on to that just to keep that love and that, I get goosebumps, that love and that feeling alive in me and be part of their world. And I looked at it and I said, grandpa, dad, I'm going to find somebody to buy this, take it, hook it and sold it for like $138, which I feel better someone else who's going to value it more than I do. It was sitting in a box, it was sitting in a box in my spare bedroom. Someone else can make it. And if you, everybody needs the money, right? We all could sell things and need the money, but what is it costing you mentally, you yeah. know, or, yeah. you know. Um, we got a bunch of other questions on right. possessions and things like that. But before we dive into that, uh, Martin wants to know, is the book available in just like a PDF only? Because yes. oh, oh, PDF only. Um, yeah, it's He said he, he, he was hoping that not tied to like a Kindle or anything like that, just a PDF version. I don't have a PDF version, but there's it's kind of a Kindle version, but you and on Amazon, but you can read it on your phone. Okay. I mean, it, it, it prints like you can do a Kindle, but it's really like an ebook, I okay. want to say. Yeah. yeah. So Martin, check, check that out. And you've got Lisa's email. Yeah. If that's not what you were looking for. And then um, Laura asks, would love to get the audio version of the book. Will it be recorded at some point? Uh, that's on my list, you guys, because I want to record it. And I think actually I asked you, Steve, and you connected me to somebody. Yeah, it's somebody on my list. Did. It's on my list. Yeah. It takes a little bit more than just this, because um, yeah. echoes and things like that. And I want to do it right for you. So let's say the next six months. Okay. That sounds in a recording. So now I have to do it, Steve. You got to keep Yeah, it. You, you made it public. That's very <laughs> important. You're stretching yourself. I um, am. Okay. Um, Susan asks advice to handle the psychology of getting rid of my mom's and grandmother's stuff that I just don't want, but it breaks my heart to get rid of. Oh, it is heartbreaking. What's her name? Susan. Susan. It is heartbreaking. And I, I did it the other day. Again, I use my life as a lot of these circumstances. I was at my desk my spare bedroom where that big box of, of uh, stamps was. And I looked on the, the dresser and there was this little angel figurine and it was just sitting there. My mom used to call me her little angel. She'd always give me angels. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, mom, I don't remember when you gave this to me. And I talked to my parents all the time and people that have given me things, even if they're not around. And I said, I don't remember when you gave this to me, there's other things that I remember. This was my sixth birthday. This was my 21st birthday. And I said, I think someone else needs this more than I do and will appreciate it. So I donated it to Habitat for Humanity. And I'm hoping, because the universe takes care, someone's going to see that. Some mom is going to see that and give that to her daughter. So it's it's like recycling the love. And that little heart, you know, that little um, angel is going to sit on someone else's dresser and they're going to look at it every day instead of me forgetting it was even there it is heartbreaking but no you can recycle don't throw things out that's my big that's heartbreaking to the world if you think about that when people just throw things in the garbage because a they don't know of a good place to donate it or i hate to say this they're too lazy to just drive over um, I see beautiful things in garbage when I'm driving around and I, now I garbage pick and put things in my van. Cause I've seen bikes and tables and chairs and I put it in my van and just drive it over to Habitat or resourceful women or wherever. Um, it's, it's, it's personal. It's, it's an intentional decision. Talk about it and really be honest with yourself. 
Um, I talk about the secrets that we keep from ourselves. And that could be a secret you're keeping about yourself. And the stuff about your stuff isn't about your stuff. Yeah. How do you feel? Who do you want to have that burden once you pass away too? And, and Susan, I dropped into a uh, into chat. Something mm. that helped me is I had a company on here called Artifacts yeah. where you can take pictures of your things and then write a little bit about it. And it's just saved there. And, um, you know, things like my grandfather's college degree. I mean, it, gosh, it's so hard to get rid of that. Right. But there's no use for that. Like, right. we can't put it on the wall. It's just sitting in a box. But when I um, took a picture and then I did a little bit of research and I uh, wrote a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you can use artifacts, but you could just maybe do that on your own. And uh, that might help you feel a little bit better. It's um, like my parents' marriage certificate that hung on their bedroom wall yeah. for 50 whatever years. And my brothers and I were like, what do we do with this? Yeah. And it's, there's well, tremendous. Took a build. picture of it. Yeah. They're, know, they're married. Like what? I don't even know what to do with mine. You know, yeah, yeah. Some, it's in some book somewhere, you know? Um, but also I want to, I want to, Add on to what you said, Steve, I suggested to my mom before I was an organizer, because she had this little cross with a teeny tiny diamond that her grandmother had given her. And she said, Lisa, you know, when I die, I want Jillian, my, my niece, to get that. That's the firstborn, you know. And I was like, mom, why don't you give it to her now? Oh, no, no. Give it to her when I die. She gave it to her because I said, don't save that. Give it to her. And I, I suggested, and I do this with my clients now, write a note, write a note. And she, her big thing was, oh, you'll remember. And I said, mom, I'm going to be grieving. You're going to be gone. I'm not going to remember. I can hardly remember what I had for dinner yesterday. I'm not going to remember what you wanted your family to have. So write a note. And you know what? Seeing my mom had written things on the back of like some of her little tchotchkes. When I see this, and I say this all the time, when I see my mom's writing, underneath or my dad's writing on a on an envelope oh my it's like a gift from heaven every time I see it and to know the story behind things uh, I've been in houses where the person has passed away and they don't have any kids and they're not married and there's stuff and we I just I remember doing a live years ago and just broke down crying because <laughs> I get very emotional I get addicted to my clients and you know it's it's and she wasn't even there but my heart went out to her because we're going through this woman's house I never met. I'm going through all of her personal things. Don't, I, this is what we do, but I don't wanna do it. I want you to be able to tell your family what you want. And more of a morbid sentence I'm gonna say, but everyone's gonna die. So if you want things to go to people that you love or a charity or something, let people know now. Don't wait. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I dropped this into to chat for everybody to read is Tiffany's uh, story about how freeing it was to um, uh, find a new home for yeah. some of her grandmother's stuff. And her, and her mother, you know, you can, we, we all feel guilty about doing this, but when she talked about it to her mother, her mother was totally in agreement. She just didn't know what to do. So sometimes having this dialogue can really make things better. Right. Um, let's see. N Marks has your hand raised uh, to make a, a comment. Um, N Marks, if if you're um, if you truly had a question, uh, by all means, just uh, open up your mic and uh, we can um, we can respond to that. And then uh, Tom DeMuth says, does Lisa's company help clients determine the best way to dispose of items like donate versus sell? Yes, we can help. And my thought on that is if it's going to cost you more to hire someone to dispose of it or to sell it, donate it. Um, get a get you know, and depending on where you are, get a good company to come in and determine it. And I, I usually, I err on the side, if you're going to, if it's something for $15, $20, and I understand everyone's, you know, income and level is different, but 
if you can re-buy it, if you ever wanted it again, donate it. And also if you think, like people, people go through clothing, right? If you have five pairs of the same jeans, someone doesn't have a, one pair of jeans. So think of it that way. Sometimes it's easier just to donate, but higher end, you know what? It doesn't even have to be higher end. I sell things for my clients all the time. I can have a beautiful leather couch. I can have a dining room set that I think, oh my God, it's gorgeous. It's going to sell like that. Nobody, even if it's priced well. And then I have a couple side tables and a lamp or something, and it goes like that. Um, try Facebook Marketplace if you want to just try it yourself. And if not, donate it again. How how much is it costing you? Yeah. And, you know, just minor experience. I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, Facebook Marketplace, because what I've found is that's sort of my test is, is that if I have something that I'm trying to sell or give away, mm -hmm. and if it's uh, if if I want to go through the energy of taking the picture and putting it up there, generally, yeah. Facebook Marketplace, you will get a response. My dad had something that was very equestrian ori oriented. Yeah. He put it on Facebook Marketplace and nobody responded. I was like, Dad, I don't think that has value. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. drop it off at a stable somewhere. You yeah. know? Um, so my uh, dog Sadie wanted to say hi. She's oh, like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Lena says, yes, but the beautiful China that nobody even, even donation places want, what are the alternatives besides going to the dump? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, there are these, these items that were, were very valuable at one point in time, yeah. have function, but you know, you try to give it away, you try to give it away and it's yeah. sort of like we're not accepting that. What do you do? I've never run into that around here. Um, check a different place for China. Some um, look at new, uh, what's the word? Catering companies or uh, small restaurants. You know, sometimes they, they'll do that. Uh, a friend of mine, actually a client of mine, friend of mine now, had China from her um, grandmother or her mom. She gave each of her kids one place setting. So they each had it. And one person's just using the teacup for plants or under a planter or, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It, it, use it. Use it. Love the China. Use it. Don't keep it all bottled up and boxed up in the, in the. You know, I, yeah, closet. I was at somebody's house. It, it's interesting. I just remembered I was at somebody's house and they were beautiful, beautiful, their everyday plates were absolutely beautiful. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. She goes, we weren't using my grandma's china and so now it's just our everyday stuff and it, it breaks at least we're getting it's, used china's meant to be broken it, yeah. it's not you know it's not plastic and then you broke a glass uh, during covid yeah christmas here and he was so upset and i said anthony it's okay that i mean they're meant to be broken it's not i'm i'm if i'm using crystal i'm i can't be addicted to it and can't want to keep it forever and he mm -hmm. spilled wine on my um tablecloth Oh, Auntie Lisa. And I said, you know, my mom taught me this, even though I, I, I come to this business, honestly, because my parents collected things and liked their stuff and had a hard time getting rid of. But she always said, we're always going to remember this date because of that stain. The tablecloth is there to save the table, you know, and even if it stains on the table, like it's you, it's supposed to, you're supposed to use it. You don't want to die with perfectly everything perfect. <laughs> use your stuff. Use your stuff. And um, and if something breaks, I used to really be into making mosaics. It's a great thing that you can oh, do yeah. uh, is with your broken china and stuff like that. Well, uh, I saw down there, someone said she works at a senior community or something and they do tea parties. Oh, you that's needed great. Some of those. That's okay. fabulous. Here's um, Rita says, are there consignment and or businesses that accept expensive crystal, linens, jewelry that can result in some financial gain? I hear you say Facebook Marketplace, but I'm not techie. Well, Rita, you're techie enough to use Facebook Marketplace. Yeah. You uh, got on you're this. You're on here. But, but that that's neither here nor there. You might not just, you don't, nobody has to do this stuff. So, um, so I don't know how to do that or eBay. Um, any sort of words of wisdom, should 
should like Rita consult with like Daniel Sanders of four sales, like uh, where I'm, if she's I say research where you're located. OK, if there's companies check their ratings, check their reviews. They are not all created equal. Yeah. And, um, and Rita, feel free to send me or Lisa an email and we can hopefully help you with a, an actual vendor. Yeah. But there are vendors out there that will help yeah. you. Yeah. You also, and, and again, I've heard these stories, but it's just worth, um, actually, great story in our neighborhood. The summer job that this kid had was just going into people's homes that were, it was a trusted kid in the neighborhood, and they wanted to downsize. And they basically said, um, he, agree, he said, I'll split 50-50, whatever I make on Facebook Marketplace, eBay, what have you. Wow. And you know, what was really cute is, is that most of the uh most of the people when they saw what he had done and cleaned out their thing, they're no, you just keep it all. And, <laughs> and and they had this, you know, this kid that was and and the cool thing about that too is the kid was asking questions about things and and mm. you know, commenting. So, you know, another thing is look around your neighborhood, uh Rita. Ew. Maybe, or maybe it's a grandkid or, or somebody like that. Um, Adele says refugee groups, shelters may need China, yes. women's homes. Um, yep. Th this. Um, there's uh, so much. Just Google in my area, you know. Yeah, there's Just a bunch. And, and folks, also remember, there's so many good comments in chat. This will be on the recording, so right. you can access it later today. Um and uh, okay, and and Janet, uh, to the person that was talk asking on the call about coin collecting, hmm. Janet says my husband is a coin collector and could help people determine the value of the coins. There you go. This is like a community type. Right, of everything you need, community. right under your Even nose. Whole purpose, okay. Perfect. Um, I I recently took a truckload uh, to a special Ukraine donation place. And they will, they specifically said, we do not take buffet, hut, buffets, hutch or China. Yeah. yeah. Um, th these items, and, and I make a joke about this. Every senior living community in the country has a few buffets and armoires, you know, 14 feet high that's crammed into an eight foot space yep. because people can't let go of it. Right. I'm moving one in May. It's um, absolutely gorgeous. And they're putting it in there. Um, and I have one. I love mine. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, this is a good one. Resource to donate and sell a, a Yamaha upright piano. Any any good ideas for that? I, I Pianos, pianos are, are so tough. I had one. And luckily, I, had, I was having a glass of wine with my neighbor. And I said, oh, we're trying to sell my piano. Said, I'll buy it. Because her daughter was about to take piano lessons. I'm like, great. So we pulled it out of my living room, down the driveway, across the hall, you know, across the street next to her. Um, it's very difficult. Try churches. Most churches have them. Schools, uh, if you're willing to donate. Um, even for, even like people have a lot of old like vintage things or typewriters or old phones try the local high schools too because they put on productions or the local theater company oh, I, really i've given a idea. lot of clothing and top hats and stuff to jerry weissman at stagecoach because they use it or if they're maybe not but they would eventually acting schools you know things like that pianos are tough i, I the best way to do that if you don't need the money Put it on free cycle have someone just come and pick it up and they'll use it yeah because that's the other thing some of these large items like a uh a piano mm -hmm. transporting it to somebody who need or a pool table you know you can pay right. so much money just to have that transport exactly um let's see um if a single item uh kathleen says if a single item is worth more than five thousand dollars um, and organizations like Sotheby's will consider auctioning it. Now, I, I posted something else in there about sort of auctioning. Uh, there was somebody who in New York City, she said, Doyle's Auction House recently told me that quality brown furniture is back and also ser sterling silver is saleable. What, what are your thoughts on that, Lisa? Brown furniture has never gone out. Uh, oh, 
because uh, oh, it's never gone up because no, I sold the, brown. I don't understand. Not okay. everyone wants a white house. I have yeah. like I have dark furniture. I love my dark furniture. Um, I do go into people's houses that have the white everything and clear and it looks beautiful, but it's not for me. Everybody, every do what you love. Um, and silver has silver, silver has, you know, always been saleable. Um, but here's the thing. They melt it. The silver. Okay. The silver. So you're going to get a silver value, a value of the silver of the day if you, if you sell it. So um think about that because i've had to give clients silver that's gorgeous from you know turn of the century but nobody wants that silver these big heavy pieces of silverware so they melt them and um turn them into jewelry turn turn them into something else so it's it's recycling um and if you need the money and you don't want the stuff donate it Okay, I I love this one from Irene. She says, "Any ideas? My my late physician husband collected hundreds of fascinating doctor figurines over the course of his long career. I would like to find a better place for them." <laughs> and then she asks, us, do, "Do you need any yourself?" But, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm curious what you would say. I got a couple of ideas for her, um, Lisa. Um. I mean, donate them, Do oh, bring, bring oh. them to doctor plate, you know, to physicians. No. If you have, if there's a foot doctor one, good, you know, put, you them, know what, put them on free or something. Yeah. You know, it would be really cool, Irene. And, and again, this is just an idea is think about the med school that he graduated from. Oh. Wouldn't it be cool to go up there, like talk to them, but wouldn't it be cool to either go up yeah. there yourself on graduation day or um have somebody represent and 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 it at all the graduates that year got a little figurine from one of the the mm -hmm. former graduates of the med school right. um, something like that but, no, but also, I think that's great talk to his medical society and various things like that I I could see that somebody out there and, and it would be so meaningful if it could carry on his legacy. Right. Exactly. And one, I wonder if there's, it's a certain brand or, you know, turn it over and see the yeah. brand. Maybe they would take them back. You never know, especially if they're unique. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Let's see Dixie, one of our very uh, wonderful community members. She says, folks are truly burdened by their love of their possessions, which does, which do not love them back. <laughs> the excessive exactly. wealth and pathological consumption of this region is real. Homes are expanding in size. Storage companies are in every block. What is this really about? Like Lisa, yeah. somebody, I, you know, I, I, Dixie, I agree with you, and I'm kind of a living, breathing example of that in my mm -hmm. house. But, but Lisa, wh what are your thoughts on that in terms of a sort of a, a societal, you know, issue of yeah consumption um do we have another hour <laughs> <laughs> i can write another book on this and um so here are a couple thoughts i myself has have been guilty about this um we want to keep up with everybody i in my book i have a couple stories about shopping when i was little with my mom who um was an obsessive compulsive shopper that was her freedom. That was her drug of choice, so to speak. And I remember coming home with bags and bags. And I joke about this because we didn't have money when we were when growing up. JC Penny outlet, like not even JC Penny in, in the 70s, JC Penny outlet and bags and bags of stuff. And I would come home and feel rich. Like, oh, we were able to spend all this money. And look, I got goosebumps again because it's it's such a rush. When you buy something, it's a rush when you blow through a stoplight. It's a rush when you, you know, have that second glass of wine, you get addicted to it. And I don't mean addicted, you know, like serious addiction, right? But there is a, an addiction in this commune, in this world of stuff, keeping up, having the newest, best, brightest, the white houses. Well, we, it's white furniture time. We have to move all of our dark furniture. I, I don't have the money or the time to do that. Um, but people, um, I'll try to say this nicely. Um, 
we're growing. I see this in myself, so I'll just use myself. Um, sometimes we feel not so good about ourselves. We don't have confidence. We don't have, well, she, and Facebook, everyone has newest, beautiful. Oh, look, they're on this trip, right? So we feel, people feel in general, and my clients, and I think I even have a chapter about this. The more stuff we have, the better we are, right? If I'm driving that Lexus, I'm driving that Tesla, people look at me, right? And I'm not judging anybody. This is my, these are my thoughts. This is maybe my thought that I wish I want. I had a Tesla or, you know, that sort of thing. I don't want it. I pay my, my cars are paid off. My, my credit cards are paid off. We are not that kind of a family. And but you feel really good when you have stuff. You feel really good. And my clients that are lower on the hoarding scale, we don't really work with hoarders unless a referral has come in from a therapist or a realtor or like you, Steve, you say, okay, you have to work with Lisa, like, cause we're a different kind of organizer. Um, people also use it to um, cocoon themselves. You surround yourself with stuff. And as a personal trainer, you surround yourself with weight to keep yourself safe. You feel, people feel because they're surrounded, the hurt won't let in, won't come in. People won't see you. But what you're just doing is burying yourself yeah. and your confidence and your health in so many respects. So there are lots of reasons why. Um, and I think we are just bombarded by she looks so she looks so happy and she has a lot of stuff mm -hmm. yep. so yeah. she must be happy because she has stuff yeah so I'm, i want to be happy so i want stuff yeah and and isabel says it's emotional emptiness that we're trying to fill with material objects exactly that's that, that void that void inside Man, um, I, I just glanced at the clock. It's been over an hour. <laughs> I know, I know. We can keep you talking. Know, I love this. These, these discussions are great. But yeah. what, what I love about it is, as, as we're talking about this and doing our best to answer the, the questions as many as we the, can. Um, yeah. in the chat is just a, a wealth of information there. And, and folks, I know like a lot of you came to the discussion and it's sort of like, okay, I got to find a place to put this, you know, uh, I think somebody was talking about a German, some furniture from a German castle. Oh. Feel free to just re reach out to me or Lisa. You got, you'll yes, have our emails. They'll be on the recordings. There's a bunch of people in chat that can also help you too. Um, but if you, but if you can't find a resource, just reach out. Right. And this is a topic that we want to keep on exploring. So uh, we're here to help you. And somebody had mentioned there's lots of scam, like on people helping with a eBay and stuff, there's lots of scammers. Okay. So you're better off, like, talk to me and Lisa and some of the people that are on this call that made the investment to be on this call today versus doing a Google search and saying, sell something on eBay for me. Um, yeah. uh, you're minimizing your chances of a scam. Right. Well, there are ways to do Google searches that are safe also. And that's why I say, look at reviews. Yes. ask for referrals um and you can check you there's a lot of ways to check but most people just want to do it fast you know and like the lady who took six weeks to do her her kitchen take a couple weeks take a month to do your research oh, yeah. yeah 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 exactly not going anywhere <laughs> no, no. absolutely absolutely um okay oh and then cynthia says the storage facilities are a 70 billion dollar industry oh. you know I think a great uh, title for a discussion is how can we put the storage units out of business or something yeah. like that, you know, because yeah. talk about wasted, um, like Money. it's one thing if you're Money. in the state department and you got your stuff for three years, you know, in a storage yeah. unit, but a lot of us have our grandparents stuff in a storage unit because we can't throw it away. Can't just lie. I had a client, I'll say this really, really quick. She was a hoarder. She moved here from New York. I worked with her for a couple months. Then after we were done with her garage, first floor, everything, and I, it might be in the book. It might not have made it in the book. She's like, okay, I think it's time to go to our st my storage unit. It's like, oh my gosh, how long have you had this? 10 years. I'm, I'm, I, I don't remember the exact. Let's just say 10 years, $100 a month was a big oh. storage unit. 
$1,200 a year for 10 years. Yeah. And uh, we spent so much money and we took out maybe three or four boxes. Yeah. No. You don't need it. I told my husband years ago, I said, when I first started getting in this business, I said, we should take stock, you know, buy a storage unit or something. And it goes against everything I believe because I don't believe in storage, except like you said, for a reason, for a move, for this and that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I, we would have paid for Marina's, my daughter's college, like threefold if I had to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, storage units are crazy. So, um, well, Lisa, this has been awesome. Oh, and, oh, thank and you, I man. know- I, because I've got, I'm helping you get, I booked you for this and I've got, um, I, I think we're trying to get you with some other so many resources. Yes, anybody please, who's, please. who's here, feel free to reach out to Lisa. She speaks to yeah. community groups. She does webinars like this. And uh, if you're in a senior living community, you know, it's great to have somebody talking uh, to your potential residents about downsizing. So uh that, that's a resource, and I'll make sure to have her contact on the recording. Lisa, okay. thanks a lot. Oh, okay. thank you, Steve. Uh, okay, yeah, and Janet, I'll, 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 I'll put it on the recording. I'll get it to you there. Okay, thanks. Thank Bye. you, everybody.